Hello, today my presentation is on module number one, Tower Fundamentals on Patient Evaluation. Here are my disclosures. Our objective today is to understand the history and evolution of TAVR, and to identify factors evaluating patients with aortic stenosis for SAVR or TAVR, and become knowledgeable in evaluating patients for TAVR candidacy. Well, in the United States, the TAVR volume has now surpassed the total surgical aortic valve replacement volume since 2019, and the TAVR volume continues to grow as of 2020, despite COVID. At the same time, the median age for TAVR in the United States, patients are getting younger with a median age of 75 years old in the low risk patients. Just to give you a history, historical background, the first porcelain implant of a transcatheter aortic valve was performed by Professor Anderson in 1989. In April 16, 2002, the first human procedure was done by Professor Alain Cribier, and this was done with a transeptal approach on the Cribier Edwards valve. And in fact, the patient at the time had a bicuspid morphology. That case was subsequently published in circulation, as you see here. Of course, after that, the first transfemoral and transapical tablet were then done in 2004 by Dr. John Webb and Alan Cribier in Vancouver, and then subsequently by Michael Mack and Fred Moore and Leipzig, Germany. At the same time, the first self-expanding tower, the Medtronic 4 valve, was also performed by Professor Eberhard Grube and Professor Jacques Sanguin. Since then, there's been a significant evolution in tower devices and delivery system. First of all, there are more sizes available to treat wider anatomies. The, there's reduced lipid profile, meaning reduced vascular complication and bleeding. There's enhanced ceiling skirt, meaning reduced paravalry leak. There's improved implant technique, meaning left bundle branch block and pacemaker rate has gone down. And finally, the, the device is more user-friendly such that it increases procedural efficiency and consistency. Currently, there are a number of devices commercially available in both US and Europe. In the balloon expandable platform, there's the Sapien 3 Ultra and Sapien X4 that are currently under clinical trial. And in the self-expanding platform, there's a super analog valve, which is the Evolute FX and Necro Neo 2, where the Neo 2 is currently under clinical investigation in the United States. And for the intra analog self-expanding valve, there's the Abbott Navator valve, which is available commercial in Europe and currently in trial in the United States. There's also been an evolution in the access approach in TAVR. Now it's transfemoral first. And of course, there are other alternative access available, but that is now in the minority, well, less than 4% of the time. And majority of the cases now prefer with extra thoracic approach, such as carotid or subclavian and trans or transcable. Now, there's been a lot of evidence generated for TAVR over the past two decades. You can see that here beginning the first in human balloon aortic valvuloplasty in 1985, and subsequently now with partner trial and evolute lower trial in the United States. And you can see that in October 2011, the non-surgical cohort was approved by the FDA in the United States by partner B study and partner A study with October 2012 FDA approval. At the same time, the Medtronic devices have also undergone clinical trial and approval. And now over 15,000 publications have been generated on PubMed on the topic of transcatheter aortic valve with replacement or implantation. And you can see that the number just keep going up exponentially. At the same time, the definitions in terms of evaluating endpoints for TAVR has also evolved. From the VARC paper first published in Jack in 2011, and now more than 10 years later, we have now walk three and walk two in between. So the science of TAVR has also evolved with multiple large randomized controlled trials with mid to long-term follow-up are now available. At the same time, with multiple national registry worldwide. There are multiple multi-society guidelines, consensus statements and position statements now published. And at the same time, the basic science has also advanced such as leap and modification techniques and TAVR explain as well to help us better understanding of this technology in the field. 
So now TAVR is indicated in all surgical risk patients. And you can see that with the US guidelines in 2020 and the European guidelines in 2021, both recommended TAVR as class one indication in the US age 65 or older and the US uh, and then in Europe, age 75 or older where TAVR is as good or as important, as relevant as SAVR. Now, why is TAVR preferred over SAVR? It's less invasive than no incision, no hot lung machine, shorter hospital stay, typically mostly patients go home in one to two days, faster recovery, back in full activity level, typically in one week. And of course, the randomized controlled trial data speak for themselves. There are no difference versus surgical unit valve replacement at five years in high-risk patients, five years in intermediate-risk patients, and two years in low-risk patients. Mm -hmm. So how do you categorize surgical risk? We now basically is really not talking about that anymore, but rather what's the risk of treating these patients? So in low-risk patients, typically they're healthy, few medical issues, no frailty. In immediate risk patients, typically age over 80, few medical issues, maybe mild frailty. High surgical risk patients, typically older, or they have multiple medical issues, low ejection fraction or frailty. And finally, Extreme risk patients are typically inoperable. There's no surgical conversion if there's a catastrophe. And usually because they are really old, major medical issues or advanced frailty or unfavorable anatomy for surgery. This is a JAG paper published a number of years ago now looking at some of the other factors categorizing surgical risk in addition to STS score, such as frailty, organ dysfunction, and procedural complexity. And of course, the other risk factors that are not captured by the STS score or the Euro score, such as heavily calcified aorta, hostile chest, severe compromised respiratory function, liver disease, significant pulmonary hypertension, neurocognitive dysfunction, and frailty of poor functional status. So who is frail or has poor functional status? That's still an important question that a heart team need to face. So the number of objective criteria that has been proposed, such as Charleston score greater than five, lower KCCQ 12, 12 score, low album level, bone density or weight loss, ADLs and IADLs in terms of independent living, strings and balances such as, are they wheelchair dependent or do they use an aid to ambulate, grip strength, five meter walk test, and of course, minimal status exam. This jab paper look, summarizing the TAVA referral pathway in terms of not only initial assessment, looking at severity of early stenosis, functional assessment, looking at the life expectancy and futility, and then of course the procedural risk associated with the TAVR and to determine whether surgery versus TAVR will be more appropriate. There are some trade-offs with SAVR versus TAVR, and you can see that here. Pair of our leg, pacemaker, and left on the branch block are certainly less of surgery, but of course TAVR is superior in terms of fewer incidents of AFib bleeding, acute renal injury, shorter hospital stay, and faster recovery. Of course, TAVR has less known durability compared to surgery. However, coronary access and your recovery intervention may be more challenging and difficult with TAVR versus SAVR. This is a neural intervention review paper that I co-offer looking at TAVR in surgical aortic valve in, uh, that are degenerated and looking at some of the factors in terms of patient selection, procedural planning and procedural technique, guiding the feasibility and efficacy and safety. And you can read that at your own leisure. However, the heart team evolution has also taken place over the last 20 years, now representing a true multidisciplinary collaboration. You're not just dealing with the international cardiologist or the cardiac surgeon anymore. You have imaging expert, high field specialist, dedicated coordinator, specialized consultants, cardiac anesthesiologists, and valve cardiologists, all focusing on patient-centered care. In terms of training, the tower has also significantly evolved. There's a manufacturer training and professorships available. There's fellowship training. There are hands-on courses for professional societies. And now with online availability, you have now websites and apps, particularly in the valve and valve, or coronary access applications available at your fingertips. These are two example of mobile apps that you can download ready for free on your Apple or Android platform by Vidibapa on the aortic valve and valve app or even mitral valve and valve app. And finally by my colleague, Dr. Anna Purakini, AL on Tavr Cap A app, looking at how to have performed coronary access after Tavr. 
In terms of pre-op testing, the fundamentals include a transthoracic echo to demonstrate severity of aortic stenosis, a TAVR CT angiogram to look at anatomy and feasibility of TAVR, cardiac catheterization to raw obstructive coronary artery disease, cardiac ultrasound to look at obstructive carotid artery disease, and finally, positive pulmonary function test to look at pulmonary uh, risks in terms of TAVR. In terms of echocardiographic assessments, where AS is defined as aortic valve area less than one centimeter square. However, you need to look at different flow characteristics and gradients, such as high flow, high gradient, low flow, low gradient. And of course, you have classical low flow, low gradient with low EF or paradoxical low flow, low gradient with normal ejection fraction. Low flow, low gradient severe AS is a pretty established category now. So we're not just looking at the gradient itself, but also valve area. And certainly you look at the stage D2 and D3 as categorized by the current ACCHA guidelines in terms of the importance on, of treatment in these patients. And you can see that not in, uh, beyond just the echocardiographic assessment, you also need to look at have calcium scoring. And also if they have demonstrated low flow, low grade AS that's severe, perhaps TAVR uh, would be beneficial in these patients. And so remember, you not just albumin echo will be important, but also aortic valve morphology and calcium scoring. So what you need to do in terms of ready to do TAVR is know your TAVR device. You need to know the manufacturer, the model, what type it is, is it balloon expandable or self-expanding? Is it intraannular versus supraannular? Do they have a tall or short stand frame? What are the sizing range of the, these devices and what the deployment techniques is? So these are the balloon expandable device. The left side is the Sapien Classic and the right uh, side is the Sapien Free platform. And you need to know the dimension of these valve based on the size. And of course, you need to know the sizing chart uh, in terms of what the treatable ranges are. And this is a after Sapien Free tower deployment procedure. I'm gonna play the video, but you can also look it up online. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna fast forward to show that with this particular device, you do need to mount the balloon to inside the transcaptor valve. And then after that, advance the valve over the balloon with the pusher and then track it with the flex system to flex the delivery catheter to avoid scraping the aortic arch. And once you cross the aortic annulus, expose the balloon markers to expose the balloon. And once you a Happy with the position, you inflate the balloon and then deploy the valve and you remove the entire system. So this is how you deploy the safety valve. We can see on the floor, identify the free cusp view. You may want to pre-balloon if very calcified or such as bicuspid aortic valve anatomy. And of course you now position with the valve and then you slow inflation. And you can see the valve deployment is usually very stable the valve was shown from the ventricular side and the in outflow typically moves minimally. With the self-expanding Avalute platform, you can see that there are a number of dimensions to consider with different sizes. And this is a sizing chart of the Avalute platform. And you can see that here with the an option for people with severe aortic stenosis, I'm gonna mute just to show you the deployment. So the important thing is that with transfemoral approach, the devices do not need to be pre-mounted. The valve is actually housed inside a capsule. And of course, you can see that here, this is just exaggerated, but you can have the option of recapturing the device. And you can see that you can go up to 80%. If you're happy, then you can release the valve. So it's a self-expanding platform. This is how it's done. This is the core valve classic, but in the same principle, you start with the inflow just below the you know, analyst where the pigtail position at the non coronary cusp. You then achieve analog contact. And then if you're happy with that 80% and you don't need to recapture and you can release the valve, you can see that how it's performed here at two different views. So again, know your tablet device, make sure you know the following features of the tablet device. Next, you need to look at the CT scan, which is critically important. You can see that here, you need to look at the annular dimensions on the top left panel and then the LVOT as well. 
in terms of risk of root injury and also looking at the relative difference between the LVOT dimensions and the, and the annulus. If the LVOT is bigger, you might have less, less sealing at the LVOT, so you may want to implant the valve higher to seal against the leaflet. On the top right, you want to look at the aortic valve morphology, whether it's bicuspid or not. Then you want to look at the base of the aortic root up to around the sinus valve salva to look at the calcium distribution because that can be an area of concern in terms of root injury or paravalvular leak. You also want to look at the sinus tubular junction and sinus valve salva dimensions. On the bottom left side, you want to look at the left main height and the left sinus height in terms of risk of coronary obstruction. Look at potentially tall and bulky left cusp. You can also superimpose a uh, virtual valve to see how it may position. And in terms of access, we'll look at the, where you want to puncture uh, from your femoral access in terms of both major and minor access. You want to look at any calcification and severity of calcium distribution of the iliofemoral artery. You can also look at angiographically where your target access point will be. And in terms of aortic arch and aortic, aortic morphology, you want to see whether cerebral embolic protection may be feasible or any kind of arch anatomy that would make the transdermal access and tracking of delivery catheter more difficult. I have created a YouTube channel called Structural Heart Channel, and you can look it up on YouTube. And I've now put together over 20 videos on how to work up using CT planning with the Fremencio software on not just TAVR, but also transcaptor mitral valve replacement. So I encourage you to look up the Fremencio CT pre-case planning on TAVR with native aortic stenosis. I've also included a valve in valve TAVR as well. So in terms of pre-procedural case plan, you need to know the device and size. Uh, if you have, you plan to use the balloon expandable valve, look at the inflation volume, yeah, access size and bail plan, bail plan, such as calcified fortress anatomy, focal dissections in terms of need for adjunctive intervention, such as lithotripsy or balloon angioplasty. Do you plan to pre or post balloon dilate the valve if indicated? Uh, so for example, if you have calcified leaflets uh, you know, or versus no post dilatation to avoid root injury, do you need to balloon valve fracture, remodel in valve in valve? In terms of high risk anatomy, what forces is coronary obstruction, you know, root injury, by cusp with calcium by Rafe, what's your target implant depth? What are the patient risk factor in terms of pool RV, LV, immunocompromised, severe pulmonary hypertension, severe COPD, concomitant MRTR or age over 90. Uh, so in terms of need for bailout, such as balloon pump, cardiopulmonary bypass, ECMO, vascular cutdown, or surgical conversion if necessary. So in summary, the take-home message for module one is TAVR is not the preferred therapy over SAVR in aortic stenosis. A comprehensive heart team evaluation is key to optimize patient selection and outcomes. And meticulous pre-case planning is critical to achieve optimal procedural outcomes. I also thank you very much for your attention.